Good morning. It's good to be back with you again. I wish we could be back together at church, but that's not possible right now, so we'll work with what we have. I want to put this up and let you take a look at it. Hopefully you can see that all right. Let me get lined up here. Uh, there is a link at the bottom of this. You can type that in on your browser. It will bring up this song, He Keeps Me Singing. It's about uh, between three and four minutes, and you can sing along with it. It's a piano um, accompaniment along with, <clears throat> along with uh, the words, and you can sing together with that, and then when you're done, come on back to this video and pick it up, and we'll go through some announcements and uh, read our scripture and pray and have our time in the Word of God. So enjoy a little bit of music and sing along with it, and when you're done, we'll get back to our, uh, our message and uh, our part of the service. All right. Welcome back. So when will we be back together? Well, the short answer is we don't know. Um, there's, there's possibilities that it could be sooner because President Trump has indicated he wants things to remain or to begin to return to normal by April 12th, which is Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. So right now we're anticipating that our next on-site meeting will be Iron Man and Daughters of the King on Saturday, April 18th. Uh, that would be with Kent and Blynn Albright. But stay tuned, things might change. Especially with uh, what the governor has come up with here recently, uh, his stay-at-home order was through April 11th, which sort of opens the door for April 12th as a possibility. So we'll try to keep you focused and keep you uh, uh, up to date on what we're doing. God willing, Jan and I will be on our way back to California, from California, next weekend. We're supposed to be at Jonathan and Cass's wedding and from one day to the next, whether we can go or not seems to change, but right now we're still planning on going. Uh, but next weekend, Palm Sunday, Pastor Bailey will be preaching. He's been preparing a message um, that he can deliver in our absence, and he'll be delivering that sermon online just as we're doing now. So even if our trip is canceled, he's going to be the one preaching. If we're gone, I've asked Paul Mays to direct the Rustic Hills Baptist Church chat, the church chat after the sermon, and so he'll be in charge of that. Pastor Bailey will also be caring for the midweek prayer ministry, which again, of course, is going to be online. Note of praise here. As far as we know, no one from our church has been infected by this coronavirus, and we're really praising the Lord for that. Uh, there are several who could have been, uh, some that were directly uh, exposed, but as far as we know right now, there's been no infection, and we're grateful to hear that. Our scripture reading this morning is from 1 Peter chapter 5, and I'm going to be reading from verses 1 through 6, and then we'll spend a little bit of time in prayer together, and then we'll get into God's Word. 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. The elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Let's bow for prayer. Father, you've placed your son in the position of head of the church. He is our leader. He is our king. He's our master. But you didn't stop there. He's not the only leader of the church. He's the supreme leader, but not the only one. 
You have also provided your church with human leaders, people who can serve faithfully under the headship of Christ. We're grateful for your direction in this. The world has developed all kinds of organizational models, all kinds of different ways that their organizations can be led. But we can turn to your word and we can learn how you want your church to function. This morning, Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ up in Boulder for Tom and Nancy Miller and for their ministry at the campus of the University of Colorado in Boulder. We realize that classes are shut down and that their ministry is very different right now than it has been. But according to Tom's last uh, uh, communication with us, they are having a ministry still with people. And I pray that you'll continue to bless them and to continue to encourage people through this. They've morphed some in the way that they've been doing their ministry there at Boulder, and I pray, Father, that they'll see fruit from that. I pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ at Liberty Baptist Church in Pueblo, for Pastor Petey and for his wife and for the opportunity that they have to serve you down there. We know that's a small church. We know that their finances are not great. In fact, the number of the churches in our fellowship, their financial situation is very, very tight. And a situation like this where they cannot meet and they cannot receive offerings can be a, a devastating thing for a church. I pray, first of all, Father, that you'll minister to the needs of those churches. I pray that you'll help our fellowship of churches uh, to be on top of that and be able to minister to them as well through some of the funds that have been made available to us. I pray for Chris, uh, our son Chris Lightfoot and for his family and for their ministry with National Christian Foundation. I would ask God that during these very difficult financial times that there will be people that will step up and will minister financially to the needs of Christian ministries that may be struggling, particularly, I think, Father of local churches. I pray for Congressman Doug Lamborn and for our State Representative Dave Williams as they work on the federal and state levels to try to accomplish things that are good for our people. Pray that you'll give them wisdom. Both of these men profess Christ as Savior. We're grateful for their ministry on a civic level. I pray for our mayor, John Southers. I pray, God, that you'd minister to, <clears throat> to John's needs and guide him as he tries to guide our city through these uh, turbulent waters. I pray for our city and our county first responders. And Father, that includes those who are working in hospitals. Uh, where they are becoming, uh, to some degree, overwhelmed by what all, all of what is happening here. And I pray that you'll give them wisdom. They're on the front lines of this thing, always around people, even though the rest of us are supposed to not be, they have to be. And I pray that you'll minister to their needs. I pray for our city council persons, Jill Gabler and David Geisling, and for our county commissioner, Stan Vanderwerf, and for the groups that they work with, and would ask God that you would uh, minister to them and give them wisdom in their work on our behalf here at the local level. And now, Father, teach us from your word what church leadership looks like, what it is supposed to be, and how we should order our churches and our ministries. We want to do things your way, not our way. We want to do things in, uh, in a biblical fashion, and I pray that you'll give us wisdom this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. This is our final message uh, in the Healthy Church series, the Growing Strong Together series. Um, message 12. Kind of seems uh, surprising that we've been all the way through 12 of these already, but we have. Um, and it's entitled Leading God's Way. And the passage that we just read a few moments ago, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, we read through verse 7, but... Verses 1 through 6, those are, are, are going to be a, a major part of the focus during our message here this morning. Our, our big idea, the one I want you to, to, to carry home with you from this message, is that a healthy church will adhere to the biblical model of leadership. And that biblical model is not only uh, found in the structure, but also in who is involved in leadership, the shepherds of the leadership, and finally, in the style of the leadership. We're going to look at those three things as we think about adhering to the biblical model of leadership. Leadership's a hot topic. Uh, it has been for a long time, but it's really a hot topic today. If you browse the Barnes & Noble website, you're going to find leadership books from all kinds of perspectives, authored by some of the most famous people you've, that, that the world has ever known, both past and present. 
I have literally dozens of books on leadership in my library right now. And in fact, if you put the ones uh, in that, that are focused just on pastors, that number increases. And it seems as if everyone has a different model. Uh, they've got a model that they think works the best, and, and, uh, and they're, they're very focused on their own model. John Maxwell, for instance. Some of you don't know who John Maxwell is. Very famous writer, uh, a coach, a leadership coach. He not only works with Christian organizations, but works with non-Christian organizations, some really big ones. He's worked with Coca-Cola and some others that are, are very famous, large corporations, and he's worked with them in terms of their leadership mo model. He, he, uh, he has a leadership style that is dynamic and strong, and I would call it the CEO model of Christian leadership. And then there's uh, Oswald Sanders, J. Oswald Sanders. Sanders advocates a much more servant-oriented approach to leadership, uh, what, what I would call a Moses model. And then there's George Barna. Some of you know who George Barna is. He writes a lot of the, the books that have to do with uh, doing surveys and finding out what everybody is thinking, and he puts that information out for people to, to look at, demographic types of surveys, that kind of thing. He and guys like Rick Warren and Bill Hybels exalt a much more relational approach to leadership that, that seeks to lead people in the direction they want to go. Sort of a finger-in-the-wind model. Very popular among politicians, by the way. There are literally hundreds of writers that are out there today with leadership advice that lands somewhere near these various approaches. So what's right for a local church? How should we set up our structure? What kind of leadership does God want us to have in a local church setting? I mentioned three areas this morning that I want to focus on, and I'd like us to measure ourselves against the scriptures in these three areas, the biblical structure, the biblical shepherds, and finally, the biblical style. So let's think first of all about the, the biblical structure. What is the biblical church leadership structure that is right? Well, that's a subject of a debate that goes back 1,700 plus years. Ever since people began to view certain bishops, uh, we use that word bishops now, but it was pastors back then. Um, the bishop of a certain church was the pastor of that church. But ever since they began to, to view certain bishops as more important than other bishops, the issue of what kind of church government is, is biblical has been hotly debated. Back 1,700 years ago, 1,800 years ago, the bishop of the Church of Rome was starting to have more influence than other bishops, along with the bishop at Carthage, along with the bishop at Antioch. Some of those guys had greater influence. And it became, became more and more focused on the bishop of Rome. And that's where you get the, the hierarchical idea that the Roman Catholics and others have put together. It's a very rigid highly structured uh, view of authority flowing down from the Bishop of Rome. The, the Catholics will still call the Pope the Bishop of Rome, but he is, of course, the Pope. And now that papal uh, structure is very much a part of not only the Roman Catholic Church, but many of the uh, Orthodox churches, Rus Russian Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, they will have a very highly structured approach that starts with somebody at the top works its way down through a whole level of leadership uh, positions down to parish priests and then to the people. Many of the Protestant churches have a different view, and they employ a council-oriented approach to church leadership, often referred to as a synod or presbytery. That synod idea is, is a group of people. Rather than one, one guy up at the top, there's a group of people, and that group of, of folks form a council some of those councils are outside the church. Some of them are within the local church setting. That's, and, that, and that's the, often called the Presbyterian form of church government. So you don't have the congregation involved necessarily, maybe to a certain degree, but, but you have a council of people that tell the churches from outside what to do, and then a council that tells the churches on the inside, this is what, how we're going to structure our things. Some of these, both the papal and the, the Presbyterian approaches, mix the roles of church and state in the leadership of local churches. 
And let me say, every time that has happened, it has been a disaster for churches, always. So uh, that, that, that right away, uh, in, in my uh, estimation, is a strike against this. And then finally, there's the model that we employ, and that's called the congregational model. Baptist churches typically are congregational in their approach. Some Bible churches and some others view this as the biblical approach. And, and again, we concur with that. We think the congregational model is the biblical model, the right model for leadership in the local church. So what is the congregational model of church government? I want us to consider a series of statements from the Baptist distinctives as we seek to define this model. First, the congregational model respects biblical authority. Our authority is the Word of God, not the Pope in Rome, not the Council of Trent, not the World Conference on Faith and Order, or any other group of human people that get together and tell us what we should believe. Our authority is the Word of God. We don't look to human tradition for our guidance, nor do we need an ascending hierarchy of churchmen to say, this is what you should believe. Congregational churches read and study and practice the Word of God. That's our authority. You can look, we won't take the time to do it, but you can look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 through 17, and you're going to find that focus on the authority of the Word of God. Congregational model respects that biblical authority. Second, this model, the congregational model, respects the autonomy of the local church. Remember that the word autonomy means self-governing. That's what that means. There is no human authority outside the local church that is superior to the local church. We are self-governing. We are not governed from outside. I mean, now notice I said no human authority. So we do recognize the authority of the Holy Spirit as superior to our own. We recognize the authority of our Savior as superior to, to our own. And certainly the, we recognize the, the authority, of course, of God the Father as well as is superior to our own. So the Godhead is superior to us, but no human being or human group of people is over us from a government perspective. Congregational churches are free and they're responsible under God to govern themselves according to the dictates of their own respective church consciences. The answer to no higher human authority, because they recognize no higher human authority. Colossians 1.18 would be one where that talks about the preeminence of Christ, but also talks about the fact that we are, the, the local church is autonomous. 2 Corinthians 8, 1 to 5, verse 19 and verse 23 in that same chapter. Third, congregational churches respect the priesthood of every believer. That is, every believer is a believer priest capable of approaching God on his own. Scripture tells us all to approach the throne of grace with boldness. We seek God's will individually and together as believers because every one of us is a priest of God. We don't see the pastor as the priest. We don't see some hierarchy of priests. Every believer is a priest. I am no more of a priest of God than you are. We all are individually and together believer priests. Second Peter chapter 2, verses 5 and 9. Fourth, this model respects individual soul liberty. Every believer is responsible to study the word of God, engage God in personal prayer, and come to conclusions on doctrine and practice under the tutelage of the Holy Spirit. Now, some people see this as a, a, a sort of a anarchy type of an approach where everybody can believe whatever they want. Well, that's not true. That's not how we view this. We are, we are responsible to the Word of God in this. So we can't just say, well, the Word of God teaches this, but I don't think that's right. I'm going to go in a different direction and have every church just blow themselves up in that respect. We are still responsible to the Word of God, but we, we are not theological robots, however. We don't follow the dictates of some higher ecclesiastical authority or ruling. Now again, let's be careful here. That's not a license to deny God's Word. It's not a license to believe and practice false doctrine. We do, however, have the liberty, which includes always, liberty always includes responsibility. We have the liberty to seek truth as individual believers. We find that in Romans 14, verse 5 and 12, 
2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, and Titus chapter 1, verse 9. And then fifth, the congregational model respects the concept of a saved church membership. A believing church is important to this model because the decisions for the local church are going to be taken largely by the people of that church. If those people are a mixture of saved and unsaved, that's a prescription for disaster. It's going to be difficult to reach godly, biblical, Christ-honoring decisions if the people making those decisions are ungodly, unbiblical, Christ-denying folks. If, however, the congregation is composed of saved people who are walking with God, we will be seeking the will of our God in our decisions, and that's a prescription for spiritual and ecclesiastical success. Acts chapter 2, verse 41 through 47, and Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3 talk about this aspect of it. And then finally, congregational churches respect the separation of church and state. Whatever the state gets involved in, in church government, the church is in trouble. We talked about that just a moment ago. The hierarchical and Presbyterian models have shown themselves to be open to state meddling down through the years. Over and over that's been the case. Right now, the state church of England is closely connived, uh, uh, closely tied, closely connected to the, to the crown, to the British crown. Um, un, until recent years, uh, the, the government of Spain, the governments of Spain and Italy and some other Roman Catholic countries were very closely tied to the, to the Pope in Rome. And whatever he said, that's what they did. But the congregational model has repudiated state intervention and continues to do so. And we do that on the basis of Matthew 22, verses 15 to 22. We do it on the basis of the fact that, that God has set up uh, uh, civic government for specific purposes, and God has set up churches for specific purposes. And those are different purposes, and they have different realms of authority, and they should not be in, infringing on each other's authority. So in summation, the congregational model places a high premium on the input and ultimate authority of God's people in a given local church, and that squares with what the Bible teaches. Now there's a balance to this congregational authority, and that's the authority of the pastor or the pastors. Among churches that practice the congregational model, there is diversity of opinion as to what authority, if any, the pastor possesses. In some churches, he reigns supreme. He's, he's his own little dictator. And the congregation is really nothing more than a rubber stamp. This is what the pastor wants. Well, I'm going to vote against it. Well, then get out. That's kind of the view of that. In other churches, the pastor is nothing more than a figurehead. And the real authority less, rests with the deacons or some strong individual who has taken control of the church functions. But the biblical balance rests in between these extremes. The biblical words for the pastor, which are shepherd, pastor, is, the, is the, what we usually say, but it's the word shepherd. The overseer, that's the word that's translated bishop, and the elder, all three of those are words that picture leadership. The man described as the pastor in the New Testament is not a puppet of the people. He's not a puppet of the board. He's a leader. He guides people spiritually. He oversees the ministries of the church. He, he leads by wise example, 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 to 6, which we read just a moment ago. Now, that said, that he is a leader, pastors, bishops, elders are also warned to avoid the tendency to turn leadership into dictatorship. And you see that in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 3. Don't lord it over God's heritage. Pastoral leadership is largely a function of example and influence, not dictate and strong-arm tactics. A pastor who's out of balance in this area is going to hurt his church. He's going to. And let me say, a church that is out of balance in this area is going to hurt its pastor. It's a two-way street. A congregation that refuses to recognize the God-given pastoral responsibility to lead is going to be in trouble. A part of the congregation's authority lies with its pastor. He must be allowed to lead or he will be ineffective in his ministry and he must lead correctly 
or he will damage that ministry. Now, there's a couple more things I want to mention here under this idea of structure, and one of them is that the focus of every local church must be spiritual, not political. Now, I'm not talking about um, uh, the idea of talking about Republicans and, and Democrats. That's not what I mean by political. What I mean by political here is the concept of power struggles. We just talked about the pastor and the leadership of the pastor and the, and the responsibility of the congregation and their authority. We talked about those things. There needs to be balance here. There do, does not need to be power struggles. Our limited energies must be spent on serving the Lord, not struggling for power. Our focus needs to be ministry, not control. Our purpose is to honor God, not lift up ourselves. So the ministry focus is very important in this area of the structure of, of uh, leadership. And then <clears throat> the last thing I want to mention under this section is that some folks think that leadership development is not a ministry thing, that we shouldn't be worried about leadership development. Just let the Holy Spirit take care of that. Let him decide who's going to be involved in leadership. Well, we want the Holy Spirit to be involved in that process. We want him to be guiding us in that area. But we, we don't want to, to say, you know, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Some, some people think that, that identifying and recruiting and developing future lead, leaders is worldly and sounds too much like a business model. They want to go there. because Some others don't want to go there because they're afraid of being leaders themselves. I don't want to get into this process because if I do, you might ask me to lead. And I can't do that. I'm not going to do that. I don't want to do that. But Paul was very clear in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. The church has a responsibility to identify and recruit and develop leaders. It says this, and the things that you, and he's speaking to Timothy, the things that you, Timothy, have heard from me, Paul, among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will, who will be able to teach others also. So from Paul, one generation, to Timothy, the next generation, to faithful men who were serving alongside Timothy, probably the same Timothy, the same generation as Timothy, and then to others, a next generation. From one generation of believers to the next generation of believers, and on and on it goes. That's how leaders are supposed to be developed. That's what that's the command, is, should, I should say, not necessarily how, but that's the command to do that. Now that has happened here at Rustic Hills, kind of by accident, honestly. Jacob Pope is serving in a church as a pastor. Chris Lightfoot is, is serving in a uh, parachurch ministry. Christian, um, um, <laughs> just lost the name of it. Anyway, the, the foundation that he's serving with. Trevor and Ryan uh, Tustin are, are preparing for uh, missionary and pastoral ministry, respectively. J.L. Clark is looking toward the mission field. That's the next generation, and they're serving or planning to serve in vocational Christian ministry. And we can be Really grateful to the Spirit of God for moving those young people in that direction. But let me say, we didn't have a plan to get them there. That didn't happen intentionally. It just kind of happened. We praise the Lord for it, but we need to be more intentional about doing that, about promoting the idea of ministry to those who are young in our church. And, and let me say, it's not just for the young. We need to also be more intentional about developing leaders in our local church ministries here who are not planning on being vocational Christian leaders. That is, we need to develop and train people to lead our ministries here at Rustic Hills Baptist Church. They may never leave our HBC, but they can serve the Lord in a leadership capacity in the ministries here within the structure of our local church. All of that stuff is biblical, talking about which people should be leading and and how they should be leading, and the ministry focus, and developing leaders. All that is biblical and needed right here and right now. There's a second focus here, and that's that biblical church leadership is built on the right leaders, the people that are involved. So who are the leaders of a local church? What is biblical church leadership? We have a number of people who are in positions of leadership in our church, among them are our various ministry leaders, like our Sunday school superintendent, who is Dr. Huff, our children's church leader, who is Amelia Taylor, uh, Daughters of the King leader, which is Sabrina, our Iron Man leader, which in point of fact is really Dwayne Pope, our song leader, who is uh, Warren Tustin, Head Usher, uh, who is Gene Krull, 
So we have people in positions of leadership that those positions of leadership aren't necessarily found in the Bible, but they are in positions of leadership. We also have deacons, and we have pastors. Now, there's nothing prohibiting the introduction of a new ministry and appointing someone to lead it. The Bible, however, mandates two that we must have. Those two positions of leadership are pastor and deacon, and, and a church is not a church. It is not a duly organized New Testament church if it does not have pastors and deacons, or at least a pastor and deacons. So let's turn back to 1 Peter chapter 5 and take a look at verses 1 through 6. And let's think about the responsibilities, first of all, of the pastor that are outlined in, in a nutshell in these verses. First of all, it says, <clears throat> excuse me, in verse 2, shepherd the flock of God. The pastor is the shepherd of the flock. Well, what does a shepherd do? A shepherd feeds. A shepherd oversees. He protects. He warns. That's what a shepherd does. Second, he is also the overseer of the flock. Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers. He watches for their souls as one that's, that must give account, Hebrews 13, verse 17. He helps them to learn to do the work of the ministry, Ephesians 4, verses 11 and 12, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. He's the guy who says, how are we going to organize these things, and how is this going to flow in our church? That's the pastor. He's the overseer. And third, he functions in the role of an elder, and that's one who leads by godly example. There's considerable debate among godly men as to whether the office of an elder is separate from that of the pastor. And without getting into a lengthy debate here, I believe the words pastor, bishop, and elder, all of which show up in this passage here in 1 Peter, and by the way, they all show up in other passages as well, all connected to the same man doing the same work, same kinds of work, that those three terms are descriptive terms for the varying responsibilities of the same pastoral office. So a pastor, a shepherd, is a bishop and does the work of the bishop and is an elder. The elder, bishop, pastor is the same man. Now there's a second office that the Bible uh, talks to us about and that's found in 1 Timothy along with the, the qualifications for the pastor there in 1 Timothy 3 you also find the qualifications for a deacon. And the word deacon means servant. It indicates that the deacons are not the equivalent of middle management, functioning under the pastor, but in powerful authority over the people in the church. There are a lot of churches that function that way, but that's not what a deacon is supposed to be. The term deacon board, or the phrase deacon board, never occurs in the Bible. It's an idea that we've derived from the corporate world, the boardroom, and, and we're all these guys who, are, who have positions of responsibility of of, of leadership and almost a dictatorial authority that they meet there to make all the decisions that they pounce down on everybody else. That's not what the Bible describes as deacons. The deacons are servants. They serve God first. And then they also serve the pastor. And they also serve the people. We elect them because of their godly character. Not because of their financial resources or because of their business acumen or because of their powerful personalities. We elect, we elect them because they are godly people. If Romans 6 is the forerunner of the office of deacon, and I think it probably is, then these men were selected by the congregation to carry out a ministry of care in order to free the apostles to devote their time to prayer and to the ministry of the word. They carried some of the administrative load so that the pastor could devote his time, or in this case the apostles could devote their time, to the responsibilities to which God had called them. Now, no church can fo function appropriately without both of these leaders in place, pastors, pastor, at least one, uh, and deacons. One of the responsibilities of the pastor is to identify and recruit and develop men to take on these leadership roles. We talked about that just a moment ago. It is not the job of Bible colleges and mission agencies to find and to train leaders. That job belongs to the local church. That is us, folks. We're the ones who are supposed to be helping people come to the point where they can lead God's people, either in a lay capacity or in a vocational ministry capacity. 2 Timothy 2.2 again. 
Now, third, the biblical church leadership that we've been talking about depends upon the right attitudes. We're kind of going back to where we were at the beginning of the message where we talked about those models of leadership, John Maxwell and, and uh, J. Oswald Sanders and these other fellows. What kind of leadership is biblical leadership? Which of those models fits the biblical pattern? Well, it's my uh, understanding of what the Bible teaches that the servant leader model is the biblical model. God has no patience with pride-driven dictators. Pride is an abomination to God. Human pride. The Bible is not a manual for a profit-driven CEO style of leadership. And it, by the way, is certainly, on the other end of the spectrum, not in the mode of a leader who simply finds out whatever the people want, sticks his finger in the air, and says, okay, that's what you want, I'll give it to you. The leaders in the Bible provided strong, godly, biblical service to the congregations God placed under their care. Now, there's two thoughts here that I want you to get. First, it means that they were out front. They were leaders. No one would accuse Moses of being anything less than a leader, or David, or Peter, or Paul, or James. Those were leaders. They struggled like every Christian leader to understand the direction God was leading them. But once they found that and they were convinced of that direction, they gave strong leadership to God's people to fulfill God's word for the congregations under their care. There was no weakness in these men. Well, there was weakness, but there, it wasn't that they were weak men. There was strength and resolve and purpose. They were out front. But they were out front servants. A servant's heart. All the godly leaders in the Bible were men who understood that they were first and foremost servants of the living God. That eliminates pride. There's no room for pride when you're a servant, when you're a slave. God's man is not a CEO. He's a servant. He's not in charge. God is in charge. He's a steward of the responsibilities and the souls that God has placed into his care. In addition, <clears throat> Jesus is described not only in the Old Testament this way, we won't take the time to read it, but you can look it up. Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 4, describes the coming Messiah in terms that relate to him as a servant. In addition, Jesus describes himself as a servant in Luke chapter 22, verse 27. And he taught his disciples that anyone who wanted to be great in the kingdom must become a servant. Mark chapter 10, verses 42 and 43. You're familiar with the statement that there is no I in team. You've all heard it. Well, let me say, there is no I in servant either. The biblical local church leader must be an out front servant of God and, by the way, of God's people. So where does that leave us as a local church? Do we have a right understanding of local church leadership in our church? Are our leaders functioning in the biblical roles laid out for them in Scripture? Is there a good balance between congregational authority and a willingness to follow the pastor? 